written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Let me read that to you again. Matthew 21, 13, not Ephesians 3, 14 to 15, okay? It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at prayer as a church, but we've also looked a little bit widely as well. We've been saying, Lord, use this house. And do you know what? We want to say, God, use this house as a house of prayer. God, use this house when we can be used for so many other different things. Lord, use it for prayer. Lord, use it so people connect with you, so that you connect with, with your people as well. I don't know about your life or, or my life, but my life is very often full of a bit of work. It's full of a lot of eating. You know, at my house, if, if I take my life, as a, as a house, if you want to use that example, a temple, I sometimes think my house is just a house of food. Amen. Anyone excited for that? And what does the Lord say? Taste and see. <laughs> Taste and see. House of food, we, we can have other things. Houses of fun. Ha houses of Netflix in our lives. Houses of, of watching the news. Hey, houses of sports. You know what, last, yesterday, it was the FA Cup final on ITV and BBC, praise the Lord. Then there was also the Challenge Rugby Cup final uh, in, in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Was there any other sporting events on last night? I just thought, wow, my life has become a, a house of sport, praise God. Anyone glad that Man United won and Man City lost? Amen. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry if you're a Man City fan out there, forgive me, forgive me. But our lives, our houses can be full of so many different things. But my prayer is, hey God, make this place a house of prayer. God, in so many aspects of this world, churches are being used for different things. They're being used as play areas for cafes and things like that. They're being converted. You see it left, right and centre. Churches being turned into houses. And I'm not against that or anything like that. I'm saying, Lord, for this house... Use it as a house of prayer. God, use it where people come in and it's just like instantly there's a connection with heaven. Instantly it's like opening up our lives and our hearts and man, it's like, God, you're ready to meet people here and now straight away. And we can go into it just like the veil. The Bible said the veil was torn when Jesus died, split in two and there was an access into God's presence, access into knowing Jesus, having a relationship with him. That's what I want this place to be, folks. So that people come in, it's like, wow, it's so easy to encounter God. So easy to hear Him. I just want to focus a little bit on the house of prayer. This morning, our lives becoming prayerful houses. One pastor said to a little boy one day, he said, uh, little boy, have you prayed your prayers yet today? And the boy turned around to the pastor and he said this, no, I haven't got into trouble yet. Do you know what? Sometimes we pray when we're in trouble, and that's the only time that we pray. Prayer, can I say, is not about you getting out of trouble, but prayer is about you having time alone with the one who made you. I want to say this if we forget to pray, we're forgetting God. If praying isn't real to you and me, God is not real to you and me. We've got to realize as a church, it's praying or we die. It's pray or we dry up. One little girl was put in here. But my mum was putting a little girl to bed well, one night and the mum was praying for this little girl and the girl wanted to pray for a particular birthday present that she wanted later that year. And she, they said their prayers and got to the end of it and the girl started shouting really loudly at the end of their prayers saying, I want a bicycle. Lord, I need a bicycle. And then after a while as it went on, she was getting louder. Lord, I need a bicycle. And she was getting really passionate and really worked up. And she was getting energetic. And her mum was like, wow, she's going she to be a prayer warrior when she's older. She, she's going for this. She needs business. And she, the mum turned to her little girl and said, why are you praying so loud? And the girl looked up at her quickly. And she said, well, I know that Nanny is in the next room. And Nanny has got an issue with her hearing, and I know that it's Nanny who buys the birthday presents in this house, so, so long as she's here, she hears the prayer, that's the main thing that counts. I don't know what else that got to do with what I'm going to say. 
speak to David. But I realized that I can no longer be casual about my prayer life. I really do mean that. Sometimes you think, well, I'll pray when I feel like it, or I'll pray when I'm in the right mood. I just don't think we're going into a time where we can't afford to do that, folks. If you want victory in your life and your circumstances, you've got to be, have a consistent prayer life. You know, you, you look back and you just think people who have faded away in your life uh, in the Christian walk. I'm just saying I don't want any of you to fade away. And the one way we don't fade away in our Christian experience life is to keep a prayer life going. It is to keep a consistent daily time where we're praying with God and we're communing with, with, with Him. I think it's fascinating and right across the world, if you're in whatever culture you visit, different cultures uh, right around the globe. Very often there won't be a Christian culture necessarily, but there'll be indigenous people there and they're doing something in their land to call out to their God or their gods or their idols to call, call out to him, be, to call out to them maybe because they, there's something in each and every one of us that has a desire to connect with God. It really is. You go back to the book of Genesis and Genesis, Adam and Eve, they walked in the garden and as they walked, they, they just talked with him and it wasn't anything that was forced, but it was natural. They communed with God, they fellowship with him, it wasn't anything forced. Then they didn't have any troubles to bring to God, but it was just ordinary conversation, talking to him about God, having real life, communing, prayer, praying with him. God made you and I to pray. I want to say firstly today, prayer must be the priority of every Christian. I was very careful as I noted that down, as I put it as point one down here, because I have to start off with, I wrote with, prayer must be a priority of every Christian. I want to say prayer must be the priority of every Christian. Christian. We need a consistent time of prayer. We need a regular time of prayer. Leviticus 6 verse 13 says this, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. And in the Old Testament, I was talking about the, the sacrifice that they were bringing to God in order to appease him, to, to connect with him, to bring a sacrifice for their sins, uh, for the things that they've done wrong. And, and so long as there was a, a sacrifice on the altar, the fire kept going. Uh, as long as there was something there to burn up, they, they were, the flame kept going in, in their life. And do you know what? That, that's something, that's an illustration of where we are at. You know, the fire of God came on you and me at one point. The fire of God came into our hearts to, to convict us and realize that we'd done wrong. And, and the fire burned for a while in our lives uh, as we became Christians and as we opened up to Him. But after a while, we can't keep living on that experience. We can't just keep going back to that day when I became a Christian. I want to say, come on, how are you fueling the fire of your relationship with God? And the way we fuel it is through a prayer life. That the way we keep wood on the fire burning is through a prayer life. The way we, we keep our Christian faith active and strong it is by coming to him daily. And the, the priests there, they had to keep that fire ablaze. If you want to keep the fire of God ablaze in your life, you need some prayer to keep burning. You need prayer on the altar of your life. Every now and again, what did the priests have to do? In fact, they had to do it every day. They had to take the ashes off the altar, the ashes of yesterday's prayers off the altar. They had to take the ashes away and sweep them out and clear them out. A little while ago, we got a small open fire in our house. And we put the fire in, and we put the fire in a few days, day after day, and then we realized what had happened. The, the ashes in the bottom of the fire started filling up. And, then, and I said to Gemma, Gemma, we really need to take some of these ashes out. They're stopping the main fire, get going. They're, they're consuming it. And it's the same in your life and my life. We can't live on the things that God did yesterday, folks. We can't live off the things of the past. We need to have something regular with God, regularly praying to Him, regularly asking Him to move. And sometimes our prayers are the same. You realize that? I think sometimes my prayers, think my prayers sound really similar as they did last week or last month or last year. But you know, if you just show up in prayer, you'll get rewarded. If you just show up in the place of prayer, you'll get reward from God. When you read the Bible, that's God talking to you. But when you pray, that is you talking to God. The greatest thing that you can do in your life is develop 
your prayer life with him. It is vital to you having victory in your life. If you and I don't prioritize prayer, we will never get the victory. How many other things do we prioritize in our life? We prioritize going to work. We prioritize our meals. We prioritize our, our, our watching our sports. Or we prioritize going here, there, and, and everywhere. When did we prioritize sin? I want to say to you this morning, prayer is a sin killer. Do you know what? If you're battling with sin in your life and you're just going through stuff and I just can't seem to shake things. Prayer is a sin killer. Prayer is an obstacle remover. Prayer is a dispute healer. Prayer is a holy no holiness promoter. And prayer is a victory giver. Turn to the person next to you and say, prayer must be a priority. There's a man in the middle and he just turned and no one was there. <laughs> Sorry, sir. I'm also saying this morning, not just that prayer is a priority, but prayer must have a time in your life. I've already said, your life run on, runs on schedules. Everything in your life is on a schedule, except your prayer life. We pray when and where, we, when and where we feel like it, but uh, is, it, is it scheduled in, in your life and my life? Your work starts and finishes at a certain time. You get hungry at a certain time and fed at a certain time. If you're like me, you go to a, fr a fridge at a certain time so you can get fed. We need a prayer time. We all say, I, I'll pray when I feel led to. If you say that, I will guarantee you will never get around to it. <laughs> I guarantee it, folks, because I've been there. I've been there, and God just looks down and says, come on, you pray. You put a time in place, you prioritize it or, or not. He doesn't force us to, but if we want the victory, we'll prioritize it. Do you know what, when you go to work, very often when, when I go to work, I don't always feel like it. I don't know, but sometimes I feel like I'm going to work and I'm looking forward to it, I'm excited about it, great, yeah, yeah. Other times I just, you know, you just show up and it is what it is, don't you? <laughs> Do you know what I've realized? You still get paid, no matter how you feel. <laughs> when you go to work, you still get rewarded. When you just show up, as long as you're an employee, you're not self-employed. <laughs> you know, if you just show up, you'll get, you'll get paid. And it's the same sometimes with prayer. Sometimes you just have to show up at that time. And, and God rewards those things that are done in secret. God rewards those things that are done in private. And he'll bless you because of it. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, they had particular times when they would go to, to pray. They would often do it at 9 o'clock and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. 9 a.m. in the morning and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They would go to the temple, they, they would bring sacrifices, they would pray. They, would ha they had an ordained time when they would pray and offer sacrifices to God. And as you read scripture, it's interesting because you realize that certain incredible things happened at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. throughout the Bible. I've listed some of them down here. But Elijah called down fire from heaven. At, do you know when it was? At 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And fire hit the altar and consumed the sacrifice. Daniel prayed for 21 days. And he says, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the angel of the Lord, of the Lord appeared to him. When at Pentecost, we looked at Pentecost last week. What happened at 9 o'clock in the morning? The spirit fell. Because they were ordained set times of prayer. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to the temple. And it says at the regular time to pray. And what happened and as they did that, they came across that man who had been lame from birth. And what happened? A miracle where he got up to his feet and was healed dramatically. Just the start of the church in the book of Acts. They happened at specific times when people, God's people, were called to pray. You see, praying at certain times matters. And I'm not going to get legalistic or anything, but I'm saying you've got to have a set time when you go and pray. Don't be casual about it. You're not casual about when you get fed. You're not casual about when you turn up to a work. Be disciplined about when you pray. I came across a story about um, some American soldiers in the Korean War. Uh, and they were in the Korean War and they, they were fighting the enemy in a gun battle and they were a number of yards away from the enemy and there were about three or four uh, American soldiers and um, one man got injured on the battlefield and the rest uh, of his group had to run back to base and they were sheltering in a trench 
for a while. When, when the sergeant came to them and said, listen, we're going to have to go back and get that man who's down. And they realised that if they were going to do that, they, they, they were most probably going to get hurt as well. They were most probably going to face the gunfire. They were most probably going to get hurt. But they, they, they didn't want to leave him out there on the, on the battlefield alone. So, so the story goes that this man said, this one soldier who was back in the trench said to his sergeant, he said, OK, I'll go. I'll do it, realising the risk that he was going to undertake. Realised the battle he was going to go to him, he might not make it back. But he said, can I wait until nine o'clock before I go? And the sergeant turned to him and said, well, I don't know if that'll be too late, but if that's the only time we're gonna go, fine, go at nine o'clock. So they were just a few minutes away from nine o'clock. This one young soldier started going out back into the battlefield. He reached his, 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 his fellow um, soldier who was down, managed to stay low enough, the bullets were flying over his head, managed to crawl back and get this injured soldier back into the trench. Remarkable story, this man received medical attention and, and, and made a full recovery from his wounds. The sergeant turns to the, the man who went over the top to go and get his, his fellow soldier and said, why did you want to wait until nine o'clock to go get him? And the young soldier turned around and said, because at nine o'clock, I knew my mum would be praying. At nine o'clock, my mum said that she would be praying for me. It was a set time to pray. And do you know what? When you put, establish something in your diary every day that says, I'm going to pray, hey, it's an incredible thing. And God will use it for his glory. Establish a time of prayer. But I also want to say this morning, there's a place of prayer to be established uh, as well. There's a place where you go and pray. I know some of you will be pray in the kitchen, some of you will pray at the living room table, some of you will pray at your bedside, some of you might pray in the office, at a chair, in your car, or some of you might go out for a walk and maybe it's in, in the woods, or maybe it's, it's somewhere alone and you just pray to God when you're in that place. The Bible says that Jesus often prayed in the mountains, he went to a solitary place, he often prayed in the desert, in gardens, but he had his own private place where he would go away from the distractions, away from the mobile phones, away from the emails, away from the children, where he would get alone and pray to God. You look throughout the Bible, other people had a place of prayer in Ezekiel. It says that he was commanded to go forth to the plain, and God said, I will meet with you there. Isaac, I love this story about Isaac. Do you know what? It says that Isaac was out in the field one day and he was meditating. He was praying to God. He was just doing his usual prayer things. And do you know what happened? The Bible says that as he was meditating, as he was praying, Rebecca came into that field. Rebecca was his future wife. Rebecca was the one he was going to marry, who Abraham had sent his servant to go and get. And as Rebecca came into the field, can you imagine it? Isaac was there praying. And he, as he turned up, he saw this glowing bride come into the field. And you can imagine it, like slow motion, the turn. You can imagine the Hollywood effect, where his eyes for the first time lay or lay or go towards Rebecca, his future wife, and they come and they meet. But I'm saying, in the place of prayer, that happened for Isaac. His life was changed. He met his, his life partner all in that place of prayer. Peter, it says, prayed, prayed on the rooftop. But Jesus said this, when you go into your place of prayer, shut the door. Get some distractions out. Leave some things out. You and I need a deliberate place of prayer where we meet with God daily. I also want to say this morning, we need a, not just a, a time of prayer, not just a place of prayer, but we need a pattern of prayer. In the New Testament, do you know what? The disciples needed some help with their prayer life. Then they realized that Jesus seemed to be empowered, seemed to be strengthened through meeting with his father alone in these places. And, and the disciples come up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us what we should pray. Teach us how to, to go about it because they didn't 
didn't know what to do. And what did Jesus do? He gave them the Lord's Prayer. He gave them the Lord's Prayer. It was a pattern that they could use to pray. And you know what? I'm going to put something up on the, on the screen now. It's just a pattern that you and I can use every day to pray. That you and I can use as a template to, to pray. And if you look down at all of those things that, that go into the Lord's Prayer, do you know what? Each of one of those, you could say, really, any sermon that anyone ever, pre has ever preached falls into one of those categories where there's prayer, priority, provision, power, and power. That is what Jesus gave his disciples. He said, How to pray. And this week, come on, I'm going to challenge you. Can I give you homework? I know I'm not a teacher, but are you up for some homework? Any teachers in this place okay with me giving homework? Thank you, you're going to get it anyway. Uh, and I want us this week, and I don't know, I hope it doesn't stay, just end this week. I hope every day as you pray, you use this thing this as a, a template. You know what the first thing? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's when, when we start praying, folks, we should always think about starting with praise. You know what? In our life, we should be a praising people. If you come to God and your first thing is, give me, give me, give me, Lord, you know, I just think it turns God off. But if you come to God with a grateful heart, praising Him about something, you know, maybe it's just a small thing in your life that has gone well. Maybe it's an answer to prayer. Start your prayer life off with praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And in the Old Testament, you know, it gives lots of names for, for, for God. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh. All of these, these Hebrew names to, to try and describe what God is like. But you know what? You don't have to remember all those names. Just remember the name of Jesus. Call upon the name of Jesus and it makes demons tremble. It makes the darkness shake. It gets an attention of heaven in your prayers. Call out to the name of Jesus. So that's the first thing. I put down the second thing. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray, you know, when we come and we pray, God, we, we just say, Lord, have your way in my life. Lord, I want to seek you first in my life. Lord, I want you to have your way. Have your way, not my life. I want your agenda, not my agenda. I've got certain things that, you know, at the beginning of the day that, that I write out as a list. And I get through some of them, not all of them. But when I do that, I think, God, this is what I've got planned. What do you want to bring into my day? God, you come and have your way with me and with my life. And we make seeking God a priority. We make seeking God a priority. It goes on to the point of the provision. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, as you come to God in prayer, you just pray that. Give us this day our daily bread. You just bring him your needs. You just bring him what you need. Do you know what? Some of you just need situations to change. Some of you need health situations to turn around. Some of you need relationships to shift. Some of you need things at, at work just to change around. So some of you need to put healing into your family life and just into other areas. And we just bring in what's on our heart. We ask him to provide for our needs. We ask him to do what no one else can do. Sometimes, you know, I just pray, Lord, over my family. My family needs you. Lord, I, I need you in this particular area. And we just ask God to provide. And put that before the pardon. We need pardoning in our prayers as well. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And we just say, God, I need you to wash me. God, maybe this week you got caught up with some stuff that you should have got caught up with. Maybe you said something in anger. Maybe you did something that you should. Maybe you just, just, just got caught up in stuff that you should. You just need God to wash you. You need God to cleanse you and pardon you of some stuff. You know, just from being in this world, sometimes we just get caught up in a mess, don't we? We just need God to wash us and cleanse us from within. Pardon us. And then as you do that as well, notice what you said. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And make sure as you pray in that line of the Lord's Prayer, hey, you start to forgive some other people as well who have hurt you. Hey, it's easy just to ask God to forgive us and just be a one way thing. You start doing the, the hardest and say, God, I'm going to forgive this person today. I know yesterday they hurt me, but because you've forgiven me much, I want to forgive others as well. We're going to pardon some other people in our lives. 
Point number five of the power. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We need God's power. We need, we need certain power that only comes from prayer, folks. Certain power only comes from the place of prayer. You know, in the Gospels, Jesus um, and the disciples were sent out to work certain miracles. And there was, there was one situation that they, they couldn't sort out. They couldn't bring any healing to. Couldn't change the disciples. And they go back to Jesus. And Jesus, they said, Jesus, why couldn't we do this miracle? And Jesus turns to them and says, I, you, certain things only come out by prayer and fasting. Certain things in your life only come out through prayer and fasting. We need God's power. And then at the end as well, we're going to finish up by praising God. It's like a sandwich. It's like a sandwich. We start off with praise. In the middle, we get into the meaty stuff. We went, now you're hungry, aren't you, for lunch? Because I mentioned the word sandwich. We, we get into the meat of, of priorities and provision and pardon and power. But then we just praise God again. Lord, we say, have your way. Lord, whatever comes, I'm going to be worshipping you. Lord, you're wonderful. Uh, and we just create a praise atmosphere wherever we are as we're praying that prayer, the Lord's prayer. And I got one other thing that I just put down here. And we touched on it a bit. And we touched on it a bit last week. Praying out loud. Do you know what? When Jesus gave the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he says this When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. Do you know what? Very often, and I, I do this as well, I'm sure we all do it, we, we like to think our prayers, don't we? <laughs> well, we like to meditate in our prayers and, you know, we pray. The problem is when I do that, I start praying and I say, Lord, Lord, be with me today. I need your help here. Lord, thank you for doing this. And then all of a sudden, I'm thinking about breakfast. My mind goes here, there, and everywhere. Anyone else have that problem? But, but when we say it, when we say it, we say it as we pray that way, something's coming out of our, our mouths. You know, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Sometimes we need to hear our own words. Sometimes we need to hear what we're praying out because that changes us. Say it out loud. I put down here, prayer is not quiet. Prayer is not meditating on your thoughts. <laughs> in my disagreement with you, that. Not just in your mind. Sometimes we've got to get over our shyness in prayer and speak out our prayers. There was something as we closed our England conference back last week when I was up in Harrogate. And someone from the front said these words about our movement and about us as individuals. We need stamina in the place of, place of prayer. We need stamina in the place of, of prayer. I, over the last sort of year or so, I, I enjoyed running. I, I like getting out and you know, just running. You're by yourself. You've got some quiet time. You can take in everything that's around you. And over the course of the last year, I've been able to knock off a bit of my time on this run because I've increased in my stamina. I've been able to get a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger, my lung capacity has increased and I can go a bit harder and run a, a bit quicker. Not quite as quick as these soldiers here, okay, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And my stamina has increased. And do you know what? In our prayer life, we need to increase our stamina. We need to spend longer in prayer. We need to do battle in prayer. We need to contend in the place of prayer. Amen. Amen. Come and stop.